Warren opens with the definition of ecological feminism. As I use the term in this paper, ecological feminism is the position that there are important connections, historical, experiential, symbolic, theoretical, between the domination of women and the domination of nature, an understanding of which is crucial to both feminism and environmental ethics. I argue that the promise and power of ecological feminism is that it provides a distinctive framework both for reconceiving feminism and for developing an environmental ethic which takes seriously connections between the domination of women and the domination of nature. Now obviously in a sense we've been doing ecological feminism this entire course from when we right at the beginning of the course um, drew parallels between Socrates's overarching metaphysics and philosophy on the one hand and the fact that he sends the women out of the room on the other between his um, metaphysical dualism um, which both is this kind of root of the, the, the dualism between the between reason and passion between reason and the bodies and then becomes the um, uh, justification for the distinction between men and women so, um, yeah, we've been up to this in some way or another all semester. Um, okay. I hope that at this point, um, the opening more kind of like analytic arguments that she's making are familiar to us. We've been working within that tradition, um, like I said, uh, all semester. The basic idea is that you create this kind of hierarchy between two phenomena in the world between two um, kinds of being, two kinds of reality, two kinds of epistemological strategies, two parts of the soul. And then you say that one is somehow or other fundamentally superior to the other. And then you make the case that one group of people are somehow or other more aligned with the, um, the greater of the two elements in the hierarchy. And another group of people are associated with the lower whether that's men are associated with reason and women are associated with emotion and reason is better than emotion or it's that um, white people are truly human and black people are animals and humans are better than animals and so white people are better than black people and then you make the case that somehow or other this hierarchy this being better than isn't a question of one thing being better than another thing for a particular purpose nobody's arguing against that um, from a kind of instrumental perspective, it's easier to use, it's better to use one's ears to hear music than one's eyes. It's better to use one's eyes um, to see something than one's ears. Um, but that's not to say, it's, it's also, yeah, but that's not to say that um, eyes are just like intrinsically better than ears. In some contexts, one makes more sense, in other contexts, um, another makes sense. But the kind of hierarchy that you're talking about in these sort of dualisms is a sort of hierarchy of intrinsic worth, that one term is just intrinsically better than the other. And it's on that foundation, vis-a-vis um, -vis the, the middle step of associating one group of people or one kind of living being with one region of, um, with one side of that dualism, and then another kind of person or another um, region of being or kind of living organism um, on the other uh, since one is intrinsically better than the other you have this justification of that the one group will dominate the other group one of the nice things for me about the way that Karen Warren breaks all of this down in like really rigorous some um, syllogistic arguments is that you can see that every step along the way can be contested I mean let's think about the relationship between mind and body so the idea is that the mind is separate from the body, that's step one. Step two, the mind is superior to the body. Step three, um, either um, uh, men are associated with mind and women are associated with the body, or white people are associated with the mind and, and black people are associated with the body, or humans are associated with the mind and non-human nature um, is associated with the body. In one way or another, um, the separation between mind and body uh, transforms itself into a um, separation between white people and black people, men and, and, and women, um, uh, humans and non-human nature. And then when you add the value in, the mind is better than the body, then you wind up with this idea that white people are better than black people, men are better than women, and humans are better and more important than the rest of, um, than the rest of nature. 
Um, and then finally, you have the logic of domination that um, uh, one side of that group, the better side, is, is justified in, in dominating um, the lesser side. Um, but every step can be contested. So right from the right from the beginning. I mean, why? Right from the beginning. I mean, why are we sure that the mind? There even is such a thing as a mind that exists um, in total isolation from the body, any more than there can be reason totally divorced from passion and emotion. Um, does it really exist? This sort of pure mental landscape vers um, versus this purely physical landscape. Um, if it doesn't, if you've taken away just that foundational dualism, then everything else falls apart. If mind isn't separate from body, then uh, the mind isn't separate from the body, um, then uh, there aren't some people that are more associated with the mind and other people more associated with the body and, and so on. Um, if you grant, though, the first step that the two are separate, then what does it mean to even say that one is intrinsically better than the other? Again, instrumentally, it makes sense to say one thing is better than another. There are certain tasks for which it's better to use a hammer than a screwdriver, um, and vice versa. But that's not to say that hammers are just better than screwdrivers. Um, but even if you grant that, that the mind is separate from the body and there is some criteria by which you can establish that one is intrinsically better than the other and it turns out that the mind is better than the body, um, are you then justified in saying necessarily that there are certain people that are more, uh, certain groups are just inherently more aligned with one than with the other? I mean, remember, I mean, sometimes I almost think that Socrates is mocking himself when I think back to the fact that after he sent the women out of the room because the women are supposedly associated with their bodies in order to just have the mind in the room in the form of the men, that the men keep crying. Um, so their emotions haven't left the room either. Um, but let's say that you, again, that you grant all of this. You grant that the mind is separate separated from the body and you grant that the um, mind is superior to the body and you even go so far as to say that one group of people or beings or living organisms are more associated with mind than with the body does that then give one justificate give the the group that's more associated with the metaphysically um, intrinsically superior phenomena the the right to dominate the other group So you can contest that as well, and you can contest every step along the way. Now, the question arises, um, if we weren't going to, let's say we contested the first point, let's say we um, contested the most basic notion that what we are are these composite beings made up of these two totally separate regions that somehow or other came into contact with one another, mind and body. Um, let's say that we didn't start with that kind of metaphysics, um, if we didn't understand ourselves in that way. what? would um, it look like to develop a philosophy in which we didn't answer that question of ourselves as um, who we are is these composite beings made up of mind separate from body. Um, the uh, 20th century German philosopher Martin Heidegger talked, um, engaged in this kind of project in a variety of works, uh, the most famous of, and probably important of which is um, Being in Time. And he talks about mood, um, that we're always in a certain kind of mood. And what's interesting about the word mood is that um, it's, it's neither a mental nor a physical thing. We could also talk about um, style or attitude as a kind of posturing in the world, a way of what Heidegger calls being in the world. That, you know, you think about an attitude one has, one embodies an attitude, um, one's attitude is in the way one walks, in the way one talks, in the way one stands, in the way one moves, in the way one looks, in the way one listens. But all of that's physical, but it's just as much mental. It doesn't even really make a sense to, sense to talk about um, it being either mental or physical. Now, um, the two moods that uh, Karen Warren is working with in this essay, as I said in the introduction, are love and arrogance.
But before we get into what that means, I just want to point out what's radical about the shift that's happened within the essay itself. There's this kind of like shift from uh, a kind of more, I don't know, left brain, logical, analytical, classically philosophical way of looking at things that very neatly breaks things down, as opposed to perhaps more of a right brain kind of intuitive sense of the gestalt of what it's like to be alive. And so, uh, right away in her very mode of discourse, she is affecting the transition that um, she's suggesting that in the content of the essay. So in the form of the essay, she's affecting the transition from a sort of analytical mind separate disembodied um, kind of uh, perspective to um, a more integrated um, uh, holistic non-dualistic perspective. I think the concept of arrogance um, can help us approach what for me has always been a kind of tension in this course and to be honest has always been a kind of tension with Socrates's philosophy. Sometimes I think that there's two philosophers really. There's the philosopher of the Socrates of the Apology. There's the philosopher the, of Socrates of the Apology, who really has um, an absolutely non-arrogant attitude. Um, he's totally humble. He knows that he doesn't know. And then there's the Socrates of a text like the Phaedo and the Allegory of the Cave. Um, in the Phaedo, suddenly he seems to know quite a bit. He knows that the mind is separate from the body. He knows what's going to happen to the, to the mind or the soul after the body dies. He knows that, that the mind is separate from the body, that the mind is better than the body. He knows that um, reason is better than emotion. He even knows that men are reasonable and women are um, uh, emotional and he knows enough to exclude the women from the room. I'm always sort of like, wow, I just read the Apology and he was sort of like my hero. And then I'm reading the Phaedo and he's so problematic to me. And then if you, I think in a lot of ways, things get only more extreme when you get to a text like the Republic where the philosophers know so much that they should have the right to dominate over everybody else in the society. But here's a way of thinking about um, how, uh, what, what might have happened. <clears throat> so let's think back to the Apology. Um, so on the one hand, you can kind of think about the Apology as this uh, meditation on humility, on knowing that we don't know, of not being arrogant, uh, not having the arrogance of, of, of believing that we know what's going on. On the other hand, um, he also is always operating within this um, context of knowledge where what he knows is that there's this distinction between the realm of the particular, the many particular examples and then the universal categories. There's two different levels of being. One level of being are um, the particular cats you see running around and the other level of being um, is the um, idea of cat the essence of cat. <clears throat> From there, in the Phaedo, he says, well, we've never actually seen the one level, uh, the, the level of the essences or the platonic forms um, with our bodies, so only, we can only understand it with our minds, which means our minds are associated with one level of being and our bodies are associated with another level of being. The first one is superior to the other, and so we're off and running um, into the world of um, knowing quite a bit. And the logic of domination and everything is going to follow. But let's look back at that moment for, for that, that fundamental moment when he suggested that the, um, in the, the particular cats, um, the essence of the cats is this kind of idea of cat. And now let's imagine that um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at this phenomenon and I call it a cat. And what I'm saying is that what's really 
essential to it is it's being a cat. Um, but of course there could be different contexts. It could be the case that um, what's essential to it is that it's a part of my family. If I'm about to spend a lot of money on a surgery for my cat and somebody says to me, why are you doing that? It's just a cat. I might say to them like, well, no, it's not just a cat. He's a, he's a, member, of my, he's a member of my family. We're always existing within multiple contexts. It's never obvious, nor is it um, in any way obvious that there is uh, any context which is truer than any other. But when, so the first thing that happens whenever we look at anything and we say, that's a cat, or if, if I hold this up and I say, that's a stick, um, then what I'm saying is that of all of the different contexts within which this exists, um, the only context that really matters is the one in which it's a stick. That's its essence. Everything else is inessential. When you think about, so first of all, I think that there's a kind of um, presumption of knowledge whenever we, whenever we say that, whenever we say that all of the other contexts within which something exists um, doesn't matter, don't matter. But then if you think about just the basic gesture of what um, what we can call essentialism, um, what you're saying is that um, when you're distinguishing between essential and inessential characteristics, what you're in effect saying is that, um, you know, this is a chair. And what it means that it's a chair, let's say, is that um, the characteristics that are essential to this object are those characteristics which puts it within the category of the chair. So, for example, the color of the of the chair doesn't really matter because I can change the color of the chair and it's still a chair. Um, so, what I've said in effect is I've distinguished between the essential and the inessential dimensions of something. So my first point is to say that what something is, is a member of a particular um, category. It's already questionable, like why wouldn't, why would we think that what something is, is exhausted by any of the categories that it's part of. But further, why would I say that of all of the different categories of which any given phenomena is a part, that any of those categories are essential and then the other categories aren't essential? Why would I say that the um, aspects of any given phenomenon that <clears throat> um, aren't requisite for it being part of um, a, a, um, a context, a category, um, all of those are, are inessential. So insofar as Socrates is operating with this assumption, even when he ex admits his humility, when he says something like, you know, I don't know what a chair is, I don't know what a cat is, I want to move from the dimension of the particular to the universal, and since I access the particular with my body and the universal with my mind, um, I want to move from <coughs> my body to my mind, which the philosopher does when they're alive, Men are supposed to be better at doing than women. Reason is, is better adjusted for than um, emotion. The mind is better for than the body and yada yada. Um, but what if I didn't make that gesture of universalism, of, of, of essentialism? And what does this have to do with arrogance? So. What does it mean for somebody to be arrogant? Well, first of all, we should remember the arrogant person, if you kind of like think about arrogant people in your life or maybe uh, ways in which you, you're arrogant, um, uh, the arrogant person is not, you know, sometimes we, we use the expression a know-it-all, but in fact, if we're, if we're serious about it, the arrogant person doesn't suggest that he knows it all. What he suggests is that what he knows, what he doesn't know, doesn't matter. I know enough about you. I know enough about what I'm standing in front of. Um, that's enough. And the fact that, so I know this phenomenon. Um, I know what I'm standing in front of. I'm standing, sitting right now in front of a tree, for example. And when I even just say that it's a tree, 
what I mean is that, um, and I and I know it's a tree. I, I'm saying I know it's a tree, and what it means when I say that I know it's a tree is that all of the characteristics of it, which um, aren't necessary for being for being a tree, it being in this particular location, for example, it having this particular um, arrangement of leaves, all of that is an essential. And the idea is that um, I know enough about the tree. I don't have to have an attitude of curiosity or awe at the infinite mystery of this phenomenon. I know what it is. It's a tree. And all trees have certain characteristics. And because I know it's a tree, I know that it participates in that category. And since I supposedly know what a tree is, this is the only moment that Socrates challenges, but if I know what a tree is, then I know everything I need to know about this tree. That's the arrogant of arrogance. And I think that it plays itself out, the, that arrogant attitude that I'm gonna to have towards the world. And, and again, you know people who are like this, or you know times that you've been like this. This sort of like the arrogance of, look, I don't know everything there is to know about, about something, but I know enough. I can stop listening now. Somebody who starts to watch a movie within three minutes says, yeah, 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 I know everything that there is to know about that movie. I don't even need to watch the rest of it. Um, somebody's, um, I, always find, I always find there to be something arrogant about people finishing my sentences or finishing people's sentences, for example. Sort of like, yeah, 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 I know what you're about to say. And when I'm relating to you, I can have this kind of arrogant attitude where I feel like I basically have you summed up that my image of what you are, my fantasies about what you are, the story that I'm weaving in my head about what you are, um, is really what you are. And I don't really need to listen or pay attention to you because I already know enough. Yeah, I don't know everything about you, obviously, um, but I know enough. That I think is the arrogant attitude. And um, the loving attitude is I, I would suggest um, a sort of more radical humility than Socrates' humility. Like, I'm not even saying that what you are can be reduced to your being a particular category and then stand in awe of, you know, trying to figure out what exactly the definition of that category is. Um, rather, I don't, you, everything that I stand in front of is just, infinite in its nature. I'm never, no matter how much thinking I'm ever going to do, no matter how much I ever know about what I'm standing in front of, um, the attitude of humility, or what she's calling the attitude of love, is one where I'm never going to exhaust what you are. You're infinite. And so um, that's a kind of a more radical vision for me of knowing that we don't know of Socratic wisdom than even Socrates has subscribed to. And I think the fact that Socrates didn't subscribe to such a radical vision of humility and still retain the arrogance of saying that like what a particular thing is, is it's a cat or it's a tree and that exhausts what's essential about it and everything else is inessential. Um, and that exclusion of the of everything that I don't know, the exclusion of the inessential, becomes literally the exclusion of the body, um, which plays itself out in environmental catastrophe as the the denigration of nature, the exclusion of women, misogyny. Um, in Descartes' philosophy, uh, it plays itself out in the exclusion of everybody. I think it plays itself out in xenophobia, the kind of like fear of the other. But imagine if we had an attitude of, of, of love, of humility. You know, I feel like we wouldn't cut down a rainforest. We would just be fundamentally aware that we have no idea what's going on in there. I mean, think of the arrogance that it takes to mow down a rainforest at the rate at which we do so. Um, imagine, we certainly would never become like, would never dare like Descartes to suggest that we should become the, that it's our, that we should become the masters and possessors of nature. Think about that, um, what that would look like in a criminal justice system where we wouldn't have the arrogance of just being so sure that we've got the right person, that the person's guilty. Um, 
and so sure even that the if they did break rules that the rules that they broke are necessarily good rules so sure that the kind of punishment that we're giving is the appropriate just form of punishment and so sure that we can reduce a person to this one thing that they did um, and exclude everything else about them an exclusion which plays itself out um, in the excluding of every other aspect of their lives so you have this person and they have a family and they have friends and they have work and they have a house and they have an apartment and they have relationships and they have experiences and they have dreams and um, then and they commit some kind of a crime the idea of punishment as incarceration is that okay here's what I'm gonna do first of all I'm going to reduce you to um, your essence and that essence is this particular act that you committed and then what I'm going to do and I'm going to exclude everything else I just see in you a criminal everything else that you're a parent or a child or a friend or a lover or a, a bearer of dreams none of that matters you are somebody who committed this crime and after I do that that exclusion plays itself out in the material form of the incarceration where I take all of those other parts of your life and literally materially separate you from all of them so I think that that requires a kind of arrogance as well so um, in Karen Warren's um, an analysis the attitude of arrogance is itself the foundation of domination. But I'll add here that I think it also breeds a kind of depression and boredom and maybe even a kind of loss of freedom that we'll see um, elaborated uh, in a little bit of a different discourse in Unflattening. There's something kind of bored about the arrogant person. I mean, if I truly believe that I know everything there is to know about what's going on um, in what's in front of me, then by definition, I'm bored with, what, what, with what's in front of me. Love, on the other hand, this kind of attitude of radical humility, of awe at standing before the infinite, endless mystery of what's in front of me, the recognition that I'm never, no matter, even if I had, literally, even if I had an infinite amount of time, I'm never going to be able to know everything there is about anything that's in front of me. Um, uh, rather than breeding um, boredom, breeds curiosity and excitement. I mean, what's going to happen today? Arrogance traps us in the prison of our certainty, while love frees us to the infinite complexities of the world. Love is like the attitude of the child that just got into this world and is so excited to see what's going to happen, to see what it has to offer. Arrogance is, so that, is, is who that child so often becomes, the bored know-it-all that's seen all of this before. Love is the attitude um, any of us would have if we found ourselves in a totally different um, fantastical world, Narnia, Westeros. But honestly, aren't we in Narnia? Aren't we already in Westeros? I mean, think about it. The Earth is not only the most fascinating place in the known uh, uh, universe. It is so, like, by a long shot. And yet, if we're honest, we're bored. We're so bored, in fact, that in a desperate, a desperate attempt to escape that boredom, um, we chop down so much of the biodiversity of this world, so much of the endless fascination of this world in order to transform it into race cars and iPhones. And just this desperate attempt to escape boredom. Um, and yet, of course, we get bored with all of those things and so have to throw them away and then create other ones. But what if we, it's the, the root problem is actually this kind of arrogance which breeds boredom, which then in turn um, breeds these kind of desperate attempts to escape boredom. What if boredom, which is the result of arrogance, is the sort of ultimate prison 
that we all um, that we all put ourselves in. If philosophy breeds love, in a sense of recognizing the mysteriousness of existence, of knowing that we don't know, then its power and its promise is to remind us of how amazing this life is, to liberate us from the um, prison of our own certainty and boredom, and pave the way towards a less arrogant, more loving, more just, and more free world.